All right, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. This is um, real exciting to be at the first Wintercon conference. It's, um, I, and I'm excited that there's still people left in the day to hear this. So that's, uh, that's even more exciting. It's, it's kind of, I think Joe must have looked at my teaching schedule. I taught last hour this past semester and had four cadets. So I've already encountered the challenge of trying to keep those four cadets awake at the end of the day. So we'll see if I can still keep up that motivation. Um, actually, what I'll do is that. Um, uh, okay, I, I do my bio. So I'm um, Colonel Stephen Hamilton. Um, uh, my um, uh, I, I don't I don't know where to begin with my bio. Gosh, so I'm right now at the uh, Army Cyber Institute, and we have Andy Hall here, who was uh, the prior director, so that's pretty cool, uh, of uh, the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, I I teach in the computer science department, so I teach a cloud computing course. This talk is not about cloud computing at all. Uh, I asked Joe if I could talk about that, and he said, no, talk about something else. And so let's <laughs> about something else. So um, uh, I, um, I'm a computer scientist, so I know this is going to have some RF and some more uh, uh, electrical engineering side to it. If I mess something up, you can, we have electrical engineers here, you can correct me. Um, that's OK. So uh, I was a signal officer most of my career, and then I switched to 53, and then I became a cyber officer. Uh, around 2016, probably. Um, actually, that's when I switched over uh, while I was in grad school. I've gone down there ever since. I'm now an uh, associate professor, and I will continue my service there until I retire. So uh, with that, I'm going to talk about some some things that we, that actually when I got to uh, Army Cyber Institute that we were discussing was this, this uh, I think it was our Army Chief Tree came out and said, you guys need to look at future stuff, well, why don't you look at HF? And we're like, wait, wait a minute, HF is the past, isn't it? Wasn't that what we did in the Cold War? Um, so I got excited. I'm a ham radio operator on the side, so I thought it was pretty cool. Let's, let's, let's see what we can do with HF. So um, I'm going to talk about um, the use of HF radio, kind of where, and, and also kind of where it's at. But I'm going to start with some motivation of trying to understand um, why I'm going to talk about this at cyber conference. So, um, it, it really goes with the title there of the event of satellite denial and disruption. So uh, first of all, let's just take a look at what a satellite does for us. So a satellite for communication is really just like a repeater in, in the air, right, in the sky, in the space. So it takes your signal. It usually will convert it to a, a very different frequency than what then if, if you're talking across it, it's very different frequencies. Having a transmitter at the same frequency right next to each other is kind of problematic um, for uh, physics-wise. Um, Usually requires like more equipment. Satellites are kind of small, usually not used for big ones, but um, low Earth orbit or, or, low Earth orbit ones are uh, obviously pretty small. And I can, if you look at the transponders of those, they usually will go up in like 140 megahertz and come down at like 400 megahertz, which is which is not that small. So uh, you transmit up, it receives it, repeats it back down, and what does this give you? It's the ability to communicate beyond the line of sight. That's what it gives you. What, what did it do for the Army during the last 20 years? It's been allowing us to just communicate in the battlefield seamlessly and not even think about it. So that's awesome. But if we look at our uh, current adversary, um, this, this could be more of a problem if your adversary is a little more uh, tech savvy. So you know, I would say Russia is probably more tech savvy than Afghanistan if you were to, I mean, just, just swag that, but I kind of think so, right? So, um, so with that, how do we disrupt this process? So I'll do a little interaction since it is the end of the day. So anybody, what, what do we do if we want to disrupt this? What, what would be a possible satellite attack? Can you just think of one? Jamming. Okay, I knew that would be the first one, and that is what I have on the slide. Check this out. Jamming, yeah. All right, so that's the first thing. So I, I'm not going to go through all of the different types, but I'm going to go from some ones that are more common to ones that are a little less common, just, to, just, just for fun exercise. Um, so I have on here the Hack RF1. I think I, I used to have a little Hacker Archon. I guess it hid in the background. That seems creepier now. Wow. Um, okay, so that the hacker would sit next to that Hacker RF1. That's a uh, software flying radio. So we've had these huge advances in the past uh, 10, 10 to 15 years of software flying radios that have come out. And you can get one of these for about 300 bucks. It can transmit. If you put an amplifier on it, you can nearby a satellite terminal, and you choose the right frequency, bam, you can jam it. So exactly. Uh, so that's one option. What's another option? Since this is a cyber place, right? What do you say other than jamming? Uh, yeah, so jam, I just said that, that jamming one option is that attack satellite communications. What's that? Hijack. Hijack. Um, I think it's in my next one. I don't know if it's close, but 
Um, actually, what I was going to say is, what if we just did a cyber attack against the government itself? It runs some kind of computer software. They use cyber attack that thing. And then now you, you actually in, you don't even have to worry about what the satellites are doing. You just worry about what that ground terminal is doing. So that's a that's a that's a different one. So we get more complex. Um, what do we can you think of another one? Uh, like satellite spoofing. Spoofing? Yeah, I guess I knew that great. That I don't know. I don't have a scan of that one on here. What's what, what's one that would be more directed towards the satellite? Oh, anti sat. Well, anti-set. Well, and that, that actually couldn't put on in the full platform. They'd go, you'd also go UAV between the ground station and there and do a man. That's a good point. Yeah, that, that could be. That's, that's, that's really good. So placement is really important, right? So if you can potentially get either on the on the input or the output. Yeah, and what you Leo or geosynchronous. Yeah, you can yeah. definitely, definitely do it there. Yeah, Leo would be a little bit more difficult and tricky in that fact, fashion. But yeah, definitely for geosynchronous ones. So um, I have this one up here. So this is a... Uh, Attack the satellite farmers. If you know how to build, that's that's even more fun, right? They can just go and jack the entire satellite. That's 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 possible. Um, I read this cool book actually. I think Andy had me read it. I can't think of the name. It was a, a science fiction book. Um, it was talking about China um, uh, doing the attack against the satellite from another satellite. So that's not, that's the one that I thought of here. So what if you have a satellite that's up there that does a laser or a jamming or something up there, which is um, the name of the book. It was a, it was a really really fascinating one. Um, ghost, ghost ship. Ghost, yeah, ghost, ghost fleet. Ghost fleet. Ghost fleet. Yeah, good book from the century. So um, so that that one's pretty complex. I mean, you you have to first of all you have to be one of the what four nations that actually put satellites up in the air. So we're talking China, India, um, U.S., Russia. Like there, there's not many that, that that have done that. So this one's a little bit more uh, difficult. But that brings me to. 2019, when I was in uh, Saigon, so you know, the last in-person one that I was able to get to, and, and I saw a talk, and this this was one of the bizarre ones that really just got me excited. I was just like, wow, I never would have thought of that. They said, well, if there's only like four countries, what about all the attackers and hackers and, and nation states out there that have cyber capability? What the heck are they going to go for if they can't really mess with space? And they came up with the most bizarre thing that really kind of makes sense. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, to, to give some background, if you're not a satellite person, um, my classmate, Drew Morgan, is an astronaut that was up in, uh, it was actually in 2019, he was up on the space station. And um, fully enough, we were able to get the, uh, I talked with NASA and I said, we've got, our, we've got an antenna and a radio and we'd like to talk to the ISS and talk to my, to, to, to talk to my classmate or whatever. Actually, I think I said we just want to make an ISS contact. It was probably a mistake. They wrote back and said, oh, it's a two-year wait list, whatever. I said, well, I can't really wait two years. I'm going to talk to my classmate, Drew. And he wrote back, oh, you know, Drew, let me see. And then like a couple days later, he wrote back. He's like, yep, there's going to be three different windows. We can set this up. So very cool. I got to stand in the, the part of the fall at, at, at West Point. And, um, and we figured out when the ISS was coming, and we had our, our satellite array tracked it all the way across. So you can actually do this with a handheld. We have the whole refill system. But, uh, and, we, and we talked to them. But um, if you think about what happened, first of all, how did I know, how did the computer know where to, how to track the ISS? That's the first question. So, um, so I'm kind of going to reverse engineer how this attack would work. Uh, what I did, did is I actually used a program, it's a free way to download called GPredict. I was in Linux, so I was using the Linux software. And it downloads this thing called TLE, two line elements. And so if you look at um, uh, any kind of satellite software, like to, to figure out where any satellite is at any given time, you download the two-line element, it's, it's a plenary element, it's the, the, the name, the academic name, I guess, for it. It's basically like about, I don't know, 10, 15 numbers just across, and they all have different um, physics uh, properties of them that, that allows the computer software to compute where it is at any given time. So um, so that's cool. So uh, what, what they presented at SciCon, which was really interesting, was uh, the two-line element attack. They said, well, if you don't have any satellite capability, if you're a really good like SQL hacker, you will find where those two line elements are sitting in some SQL database and you can get there. I'm like, oh wow, then you mess up and people can't track the satellite. They're like, no, 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 they need to be more bizarre. They're like, no, actually it turns out the two line elements for space debris as well. So what they said, they proposed this crazy idea of the, the, the most slow burn cyber attack you could possibly imagine. They said, what if you were to manipulate the debris to make it look like it's gonna collide into uh, into a uh, 
satellite, and the satellite's one of those maneuverable ones that can use thrusters, and they have a limited amount of fuel, but they can, they can thrust to, to protect themselves. We just keep doing this like over and over again. Eventually they run out of fuel, and then the satellite can't be controlled, and it, and it dies. So what a crazy side of fact, but it, it's, you know, this is what these things are people think of. So, uh, so that's my motivation for, for why I'm, I'm going to talk about HF. So HF, as I said, is a cold war uh, communication, but as I told it, I have to be getting. But if you think about it, it's really a physics thing. It's not, it has nothing to do with really time other than when Mark Twain figured it out back in the, the early part of the last century. So to communicate beyond the line of sight, you do one thing, you do repeaters, which is obviously like your retrain station up on the, on the hilltop. That, that's great for the battlefield. Um, use a satellite, let's just say that that just got disrupted. And then you do trouble scatter, which that's just a complete disaster. If you're into electronic warfare, you don't want to put thousands of watts down range. That's just a really, really bad idea. Um, so that leaves us with HF. So we, at the end of the day, I think HF is one of these really unique places because it does something a little special. And if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, there's, there is, uh, I'll just shut the door. Um, that's okay. Uh, so, the green is where HF is, and like I'm going to turn everything, it's actually on the, on the far left, I don't know if I can slide the picture, the far left is visible light, which is like really small, so this is electromagnetic way of hitting us right now. Um, but HF is so, it's different because of this uh, ability for it to go up to the ionosphere and retract back down. So when we talk to satellites, we want to be above HF, so we can shoot through the ionosphere. When we want to talk on HF, we want to bounce off of it, and when we want it to do nothing, I guess we go below that and it gets absorbed by the atmosphere. So, um, so where is it? It's between three and uh, 30 megahertz. Uh, really, the range that you can bounce is going to vary by the time of day, the, the sunspot cycle, and the season. There's, there's a lot of different variants. Um, but it allows you to do this. No satellite required. No strings attached. Literally, your antenna radio off the atmosphere, and then an antenna radio receive on the opposite end. So, uh, here we go. What's the catch? Frequency selection, that's one catch. Um, so we got to figure that out. I'm going to talk about how we, how we figure that problem out. Uh, antennas, if you look at HF antennas, they're not the antenna that you can't even see because it's got your cell phone on. It's usually a little bit bigger than that. So um, that's actually a real small one. The loop antenna is a pretty cool idea. It's got a small bandwidth, but you can, it definitely works. Um, the other catch is data rates. This is the, this is the part that, that I'm going to spend a little time on just because we all love our data. I mean, that's we're we're at a cyber conference. We all, all know how important data is and how important it is to communicate data. So, data rate. When I think of HF, I, you have to automatically say we're not doing a VTC over HF. If somebody does that, I'd like to see it. I wouldn't want to see it on the spectrum because it probably would be faster. Um, it's really more like text messaging. So, if you think of text messaging, messaging that's that's the data you can get. Um, I will say we do um, we did a balloon set. There's a whole other project I'm involved with, and this last year was the first time we actually well. Last year, the first time we got it working, but we did slow scan television, which allows you to send an image. And it takes about uh, 30 seconds to a minute to send one picture, but that can, that can be done over HF as well. That's not uncommon. All right, and we do have a uh, group from Military Harris. I did the PRC 160, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I got the chance to visit, I know you're probably in a completely different division, but I got a chance to go to Rochester a few weeks ago. It was really exciting. All right, so frequency selection. So, ALE to the rescue. This is an interesting thing that is not frequency hopping. I, I have to say that because I didn't know that people got this confused, but really one of the smartest guys I know in radio was like, you can really jam ALD. And I'm like, well, of course you can because it's not going to be jam resistant. That's not the point. ALD is automatic link establishment. The idea is the soldier's not going to sit there and go to a bullet cap table and say, this is the time of day, this is, the, this is where we're at, this is what frequency I need, and, and then I can plug this in the radio and then change that. I mean, Who's going to have time to do that? Nobody. So ALE is basically a brute force way that uh, it was the NATO standard, but uh, Harris implements it in their radio, Conan implements it as well. The idea is it cycles through different frequencies and it does sounding with your network and says, okay, this is the best one for right now. And then you, when you go to key, you say best frequency, it just hops to it. It actually doesn't even tell you what it is. It just goes through, it says channel one or channel whatever. You have to have a computer program. A little bit of work, but the planner has to know what they're doing. The soldier doesn't really have to know a bunch of physics to figure this out. Um, so what it does, it'll sit there, like let's say with these two radios, it starts maybe 3.4 would be one channel, and it would get a, a, a door by the atmosphere and not make it. 
Um, the 5.5 to 5.6 is going to frequency of use that this other example I'll show. Um, but that one, um, it happens to be the right one, and that'll that like the proximity to go too high at a certain time of day, and it needs to go straight through it. Um, so that is, um, that's basically how we fix, uh, fix it. Now, ideally, like I said, not frequency hopping. It literally will sit on the frequency, wait for a second, and move to the next one, then wait for a second, move to the next one. So it's, a, it's kind of a slow, kind of clock-like operation where it goes. If the radios are synced, then they'll be hopping, they'll be, they, no, not hopping, they will be selecting those frequencies at the same time. But I actually learned last year in this cool Noble Skyway that's a military cyber, a military, um, seems like it has to apply, HF exercise that the uh, Canada runs. And uh, we actually were working with various units and we couldn't do the timing. And, and it turned out if we just wait long enough, we can get all the frequencies or, or all the radios are cycling through the frequencies. If we keep transmitting on one channel, it'll eventually link up with the other radio. So that, that was something that was cool and new. I talked to Harris guys and they're like, yeah, that's, that's absolutely Anyway, so that solves the, the frequency problem. The next problem, the data rate. Oh, this is the one that's really difficult. So I actually uh, have a paper out on um, embracing low bandwidth. I'm really like a big fan of embracing low bandwidth. And it's not something anybody wants to hear. They want, they want more bandwidth, right? I really think that it's important for many control to understand how to operate in a low bandwidth environment. It's super important. That, that being said, Maynard doesn't even have to know they're using HF. This is the cool part. So that's ATAC over there. And this was actually done, uh, a test that was done, where you had ATAC and it's, um, so it's an Android technical fault kit. You have unit locations, and, and it goes over the cell service or whatever, your Wi-Fi. And, and there's a server that maintains unit locations, and then you get updates. It's not a little blue force tracker kind of thing going on. So um, uh, when, you, when you use this system, and it's fine over this data, uh, then and let's say your, your cell goes out and it, or, or your Wi-Fi goes down and your satellite gets bumped, whatever it is. The data that's actually on, the data that's actually needs to be transferred to it, if you think about it, it's really like those unit location positions. Like, you already got the map, it's already loaded on there, all the graphics are there. You really just need like a grid coordinate and an icon number or something like that. So if that's all you have to transfer, that's something that's HF transportable. That's a text message if you think about it. So what they did is they had these two servers Link over HF, and when they cut the link, they or cut the, uh, they, they, they said, right, we're going to force some traffic over HF. People are still using the ATAC, not even know that they're using HF. So that's really cool. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of uh, this low data rate in, in, in my, uh, you know, and I'll keep saying this over and over again, it's important because you don't, I've already showed you how there's already some complexity with HF. Not everybody in the world needs to understand how to, all the complexity of HF to use it. We just need to have a few people to put things in the right place and set it up as a nice little backbone. So, so that's um, that's that's how I feel about about doing low data rate. Now, um, I'm going to talk about what we did like practically, just to, because I really wanted to get to the bottom of a, of a couple of different uh, things. Um, one thing is called well, this near vertical instant skyway. So I talked about how we bounce out the ionosphere. When I was a kid, I remember talking on centimeters. I um, we were just talking about this earlier today, uh, which is uh, 28 megahertz, it's pretty high. During this sunspot cycle, like right now, I'll give you some examples here in a minute. Um, you can you, you bounce 10 meters off the line, so it's super cool during the daytime. Uh, so the thing is, I'm, I was always interested in talking as, as far away as possible. I was always like, well, you know, I, I took them 10 meters to Germany from my neighbor's house. You know, the internet wasn't really much of a thing at the time. I was I was like so excited. I'm like this is crazy. Of course, he had this huge power, you know, thousand dollar system, whatever. But I, it really just got me thinking about man, this one thing about ham radio. Like you think of picking up a radio, and it's always it's always line of sight. It's always point to point. You don't think about what if I can talk to somebody like really far away. But that's like inspiring. The problem is in the army, we don't care to talk usually to talk to other countries, you know, for for a PCT. PCT must talk to itself. So we go out to NTC, and we have this great thing, I put the Keeper Mountain, also known as an LOS blocker. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can't talk VHF across that thing. We proved that because I had to do it just because I'm more of an applied scientist. I see things work, not work, and, and show other work. So we first actually went on this little small, like, uh, uh, the first one I think off to the left might be where it was. We did a VHF, so two meters, 140 megahertz, something around, around there. And, uh, it worked. And I was just like, well, we can't see the other person. How is this working? Knife. Well, what's that? Knife edge. Knife edge diffraction. Yes. 
<laughs> you have your, your hand license? Yeah, I do. I'm also an AeroPuster. Air Puster, okay, so that's great. Uh, absolutely. No, it's actually on the, the technician test, I think. I remember that. Anyway, could you repeat uh, that? What is it again? Now you mentioned the fraction. So even though that there's some kind of blocking that's happening, as the radio wave comes over, there's like a little bit of the fraction that comes down. So you can be on the other side of that hilltop and still and still uh, receive the signal. It's going to be meter, but and depending on, you know, at, at some level it breaks, but, but you can do that. So we had, we had that actually happen, which is really cool. I was confused. I had to go back and look it up, and I, it's been a long time since I got my license. And again, I'm a computer scientist, so I, I really like to understand what's going on. They drove around the other side of the mountain, and uh, definitely no cops. Like, they could not at all whatsoever, could not talk across it. So I was like, okay, we can't do that. So let's set up this thing. They have a buddy pole, a modified buddy pole for the frequency. We had to go to 60 meters. And we set this up. So I was like, okay, this is great. What we're going to do is we're going to talk across this. We first started with voice. Voice was great at 100 watts, it was great at 50 watts. Below that, it was kind of flaky. And so I was like, oh, let's try some data. So we switched over to kind of a, a more, like I said, even though HF has been around a long time, some really cool advances have happened over the past few years. Um, and I did get a chance to meet Joe Taylor. He invented this crazy protocol called FP8, um, which is a, uh, it, it's for weak signal propagation. And it, it's just phenomenal. It's like, it, it, it took it, the, the ham radio by storm, like you go on HF, you'll hear what the hum of FP8 stations are going all the time. So, um, so we used JS8, which was Jordan Shear's variant, so we could actually do messaging. So FT8 is kind of more automated. It just has the call sign and, and your signal report. It's, it's, it's really like, it's the perfect like nerd, like introvert ham radio. It's like instead of having a, a long, what they call it, rag chew session or talk, talking to somebody for a long time on a Saturday morning, it's like, I'm going to contact yes next. I'm going to get like good like contest and stuff like that. So, um, so we did um, JS8 and we, we did our first um, transmission uh, at 50 watts worked fine, 10 watts it worked fine. Then I was like, huh, I wonder how low we could go. I was kind of playing with the, the limbo here. We, so we ended up going down to, to 5 watts, and then we got down to 1 watt. At that point, we were still seeing it, but like, it makes sense we're still seeing it. But dang, I mean, 1 watt, that's pretty cool. And then how low is this radio going? This is the aircraft radio. I turned it down to 100 milliwatts. Perfect copy at 100 milliwatts. Um, that was significant because at 500 milliwatts, we happen to have this cool thing I'll talk about in a second called Watchdog. Um, but at 500 milliwatts, our direction finder could, could, see, could kind of see where we're coming from. At 100 milliwatts, we were just in the middle. Like, it could not, we couldn't really see it. It was really, really fascinating. So um, after I got done with this, I was like, I need to understand really how this works. I, again, I, I was not even convinced that this NIMBUS stuff was like real. It's kind of like magic with the radio and like that. I mean, there's a lot of people that know about it. There's a whole lot. You know, every time I give a talk to that new author, it's like, well, kind of specialize in pin beam. I'm like, guy, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a vertical antenna. That's the one thing. You know, your vertical is this guy. Like, we propagate off the perpendicular. So vertical is the opposite of what you want. You want a horizontal dipole. Or an inverted figure for reasons I don't have there. So what we did is we have these transceivers that one uh, up here. I, I was actually for one, I think, uh, in, in the C position. There was one place that was used for another player. Uh, so that's the terrain, and that's kind of what it looked like. I like Google Earth, it's kind of fun to play with. So I said, well, let's model it and see how high is the ionosphere. Do you know like, how high the ionosphere is? It kind of, I mean, it gives a number that doesn't give you a perspective. And so when I modeled it, and again, this is not a, this is more an artwork thing, and this is it's based off of what Google Earth says where the ionosphere was that day. Um, this, this is about what the shot looked like. So that's kind of crazy to think. For us to go just across this mountain, we went, Way up in the sky and then all the way back down at 100 milliwatts. It's kind of cool. Um, so, sitting next to the transceiver was um, this other thing that we have called uh, the watchdog. Uh, pretty cool thing. It uses that uh, self confined radios and uh, it does some direction finding. It also gives us a really cool thing called elevation of arrival. So, we could see what angle we were coming down at, which is around 860 degrees, I think. When I saw it, I'm like, you can't, I mean, at this point, we have an independent system that's verifying we're doing this NIMBY. So I was fully confident we did a full NIMBY shot that day. Um, but it was a lot of fun. So, um, so what what next? So we, we have this way to communicate. We have texting. Um, our, my next question was, how do we do things like hide, and how do we use this as a, as a good like covert kind of channel? So um, I happened to read this book. If, if you're if you're into radios, like just think of the old school question stuff. This book is phenomenal. They declassified a bunch of CIA tables and stuff and, and put it in here. But it showed how advanced the Russians are 
at, at doing things like hiding signals. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of uh, tell you just a, a bit about this function, kind of give you a perspective of, of how advanced they were. They had a, uh, a chimney in the U.S. Embassy in Russia that was in the 78, 79, 80, uh, 1980. So they hung an antenna, and when, they, when, when they, we finally were able to extract it and bring it back to NSA and do a bunch of work, which they talk about in the book, um, but this is like the dumbest thing. It doesn't make any sense. It's a really weird antenna. And after some research and some thought, they realized what it did is it detuned the local, the local broadcast station completely, so nulled it out, which allowed it to receive signals that were right next to it. So the bugs that were in the embassy were right next to the, 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 the broadcast station. So when you go with the sweeper, you're blown away with the broadcast station. You'll never even detect this thing. But this antenna would detune it so that it could actually extract that traffic. So they were doing this in 19, I just, it blows my mind to think it was that long ago and you're coming up with these kinds of things. But we need to be thinking in advance about how to do it. And the terminology in the EW field is LPI, LPD. So low probability of detection. So you don't want it to be signal to be detected and you definitely don't want it to be intercepted. So what do you do to do that? LPD, there's there's some, the, the, we actually did mostly from the radar community because that, that's the one that's kind of loud and one kind of do things to modify what that looks like. Um, so there's there's some techniques to do that. I, when I talked to Harris, they really wouldn't tell me what they were doing. I showed them some of the IQ kids that I captured, and they said, don't share it with anyone. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, but they do have an OK LPD module on the 160 radio, which is awesome. Um, the low probability of intercept, uh, so you can obfuscate the modulation, which they definitely did that. It was obvious with the data that I looked at. Um, spread spectrum, you know, those are kind of components. And of course, you want to encrypt it. Um, so uh, talk about FT8. I don't know if I'm just going to run for a long time. Talk about FT8. Um, you can always come try this at home. I want to try this at home. This is super cool. So last Friday, um, I just wanted to say, oh, let me do another test because all my data here is from like a few years ago. I just want to see what it's like now. Plus, as some of you may know, the Sun Clock cycle, cycle 25, is awesome. Really good right now. So there's great propagation happening. Um, so I did one watt from West Point. Um, there's this cool thing about re reverse beacon networks. A lot of receivers that are out there, and they'll just kind of send back to the internet to this database of what signals they received. So I transmitted for uh, like one watt from uh, West Point, and I was able to, to reach that far top station was in Saskatchewan, and the far bottom one was in Puerto Rico. One watt, pretty cool. All right, so I did a, uh, I want to make an actual link, and so I like, I switched to, I think I switched to 10 meters on this one. It should say it on here. Um, maybe not. Uh, let's see on there. I think it was 10 meters. Uh, yeah, it does say on, on, on this part of the pattern. So this is this is the conversation I said before. It's kind of you don't really get to say anything, but W2KDY was the West Point station, and I was talking to a guy in Brazil, PU2PN1. I was at 10 watts, it was a little bit a little bit stronger, but I just wanted I, I wanted to do it real quick and that just connected really quickly. No, no issue with that. So um really cool reverse speaking network. This, I loved thinking about this because old PMs used to say, like, oh the internet just ruined the radio, nobody's gonna be excited about it anymore. The internet has enhanced ham radio. Our understanding of how these work is really cool right now, especially with the reverse beacon network. So, what are my key takeaways? I already said embrace low, low data rates. Um, and the real thing is training and practice. Um, we're going to have to have some experts out there that know how to set up the DHF network. Um, and the, the, the Harris 160 radio is just so cool. And I got a chance to do the factory tour a couple of weeks ago, and their factory. It, it makes me sleep better at night because we always think of everything being built in China. When you see a full on factory line from circuit board printing all the way to the end line where they're doing the QA to QC, I now know why that radio costs like $20,000. <laughs> um, it, 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 it would say $20,000 worth of work. It definitely, it definitely is. And they even have the, the, the crypto side that actually separated from where they do their foreign sales. There's a whole other part where they do the crypto side. And it, 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 it moves off the line for that. So, yeah, they're great Americans. I, I enjoyed that. Um, so I came to them and I said, I got one problem. I wanted to do FT8. I wanted to do something like FT8 that I don't want it to be seen. FT8, you can see it. You can hear it. It's something whistling on it. And, uh, and they were like, oh, we already did this. We got this thing called last dish data. And I'm like, oh, what's that? I, I know last dish voice, which is more like a recording that kind of sends over time. And they said, yeah, we got this thing called last dish data. And it's amazing. It's got, um, they worked up about three kilohertz bandwidth, which is about the same as the single side band voice. Uh, it, can, it can text, it's about 10 bits a second, so really slow text, but it can text. I think you're okay with 10 bits a second when you imagine that they talk across the US on 25 milliwatts. 
that that blew my mind. I was like, okay, I'm going to need to do 25 milliwatts. And they operate well below the noise. So you, I don't even know if you have to do any LPI LPD at that point. If you're just that much the noise, who's even going to see in the first place? So um, that's pretty exciting. I'm real excited that that pairs with that. They're, they're going to actually give me that waveform to play with. So hopefully I'll get the chance to test it. All right. With that, I'm going to do that. Any other final questions? <laughs>